is a wonderful life. That's what they say. Have you ever seen that movie? It's a wonderful life. Two of you have. It's, it's, if you have three of you, if you've never seen that movie, it's worth getting. It's been around a couple of years. I've never watched it. Uh, I've watched parts of it, but I've never watched it <laughs> but I'd be willing to say you've probably watched The Grinch Who Stole Christmas oh, yeah. many times through. <laughs> Not many times. Through. How many times have you seen The Grinch Stole Christmas? Uh, I actually went to when the when the one came out. I actually went up to uh, McHenry there to the theater. Took my grandkids up to watch it. Uh, maybe three times, four. <laughs> and you've not watched completely. It's, uh, <laughs> or Miracle on 34th Street. I've not watched that clip from you. Probably that you've watched Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll talk. We will talk at the church. Wow. This, by the way, I've already hit the record button. Did you know that? Yeah, but you can edit that out. I doubt it. I doubt it. Oh, at this time, I want to ask uh, Brian and Lisa to come up and do our Advent reading. You guys just want to do it from down here? Sure, yeah. Okay. My wife gave me instructions. Hang on. <laughs> I've done actually pretty good with this, you know. Okay, I'm ready. Lord, today we think back to the first Christmas when you brought the light to a cold and dark stable. What a gift for your parents, shepherds, and magi to see the face of God. They believed what was spoken to them would be fulfilled. Their faith brought to them to the manger where you lay as a newborn child. You became like us so we could become like you. It is so tempting to be discouraged in this world where priorities seem to be for everything but getting to know you. Help us to feel your presence in a special way this Christmas and inspire us to keep you at the center of our relationship. You are for us. You lay down your life for us to know your love. Help us live by your example and see your face in everyone we encounter, especially your lifelong prayer partner you bless us with. Bless us with the fruits from the sacrament as we remember your royal presence is found in the Eucharist. Now some scripture from John 1, 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through, came to be through Him, and without Him nothing came to be. What came to be through Him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. He was in the world, and the world came through him. He did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory the glory as the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Good light. It's lit. Good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Great, that candle's burning. Whoop. We're good for like 20 years. 20 years. <laughs> Open your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to talk about the Christmas season one more time, but we're going to take it a little bit beyond that. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 10 to 17, just as our background reading, and we have some other things to look at uh, this morning. Isaiah 7, verses 10 to 17. 
Here's what it says. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. The prophecy of Isaiah proclaiming the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. And now, Lord God, we just pray and ask that the time of your word be shared. That you can open our hearts this morning, Father. And bless us this day in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I got to tell you, I, I, truthfully, honest to goodness, I will tell you, I, I have 14 pages. Yeah, Fred. <laughs> a lot of statistics, and I'm not going to get into those. I just, I just printed them off for just my own, own information. So you're, so rest assured, you're going to be good on that. You're going to be good on that. But the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 7, I, I thought it was interesting that the Lord spoke to Ahaz and, and he said, ask the Lord your God for a sign. You know, God spoke to you and he said, you know, ask for a sign. And yet Ahaz would not do it. He would not ask God for a sign, even though God said to do so. And so therefore Isaiah the prophet decided to speak again for God. He says, here's the sign, a virgin. <laughs> A hey, virgin's going to give birth. He's going to give, she's going to give birth. You're going to call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. Now, I'm not sure about you, but, you know, but back in the day, I, you know, and I heard Rick in Sunday school, we're going to talk about a little bit about what Rick was talking about in Sunday school, John the Baptist here in a second, but the, the idea of, you know, because he was talking about the, the clothing, clothing of uh, John and, you know, how camel's hair and the honey and maybe not the locusts, you know, how you're talking about a little bit of background on that this morning. But for a virgin to give birth to a child, that was still something that was never, ever done before, okay? And, and so, so, so Isaiah is telling Ahaz and the people that this is what's going to happen. This is a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call him Emmanuel. That was the sign that was going to bring. And he's going to know right from wrong very, very early in his life. You'll know what right from wrong is according to what the scripture is that Isaiah is telling us this morning. That Jesus is coming into the world. Now this was written some 700 years before he came. A prophecy well into the future. But still a prophecy nonetheless. Prophecy that was just so, you know, because because God, when He spoke to Ahaz, said, "Ask me anything." There's nothing too too outlandish, no, nothing too bizarre. He's really telling, you know, Ahaz. He says, "Just just ask me whatever. Ask me for a sign. I don't care what the sign is. Just ask me for a sign, and I don't care how outlandish it is. And this is kind of outlandish, isn't it, for a virgin to give birth to a son, right? A virgin, no no man." Okay, give birth to a son, the son of God, because when he says Emmanuel, God with us, he's saying he's not only is, not only is this virgin going to conceive and give birth to a son, but he's going to be God. That is about as far out in the outfield as you can possibly get. But this was the prophecy. This was the prophecy. Prophecy foretold 700 years before Jesus came. 700 years. And then just a little bit later in our call to worship, actually, in Isaiah chapter 9, we read for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Talking about the future child coming, the Savior of the world coming to this world. Signs that are given about his coming. 
And of course, we've talked about it before over the last couple of weeks. I'm just reminding you a little bit this morning where, and we find it in Micah in that fifth chapter, where Micah, the prophet, says that the son, Jesus, the Messiah, will be born in Bethlehem. He's coming into the world. And yet, as was read in our scripture reading this morning for our Advent, the world didn't even recognize him, didn't acknowledge him, didn't, didn't recognize that coming. Didn't recognize the coming. And so what Rick was talking about in the Sunday school this morning when he's talking about John the Baptist, a sign. John the Baptist was a sign that was given of the coming of the Messiah. And we go back to the Old Testament. And we go back to Malachi in the third chapter, where Malachi says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. The messenger being John the Baptist, foretold by Malachi 400 plus years prior to. Okay, remember we had these years of silence. And then again, Isaiah in the later chapters, in chapter 40, says a voice one calling in the wilderness, uh, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight in the desert, the highways, okay, every valley raised up, Isaiah, okay, prophesied the coming of John the Baptist in preparation for Jesus. But probably, as far as signs given, those are all prophecies, but no one really can pinpoint the time. I mean, yeah, the prophecy written 800 years, 700 years, 400 years before Jesus, it didn't really pinpoint anything. Does anyone know when it was kind of more accurately pinpointed? Who in the Old Testament really gave us a bead on to when Jesus was coming? Because people, you know, people were, when Jesus came, they were really expecting. They were, you know, they knew the Messiah was coming at any time. But there's one prophet in the Old Testament who clearly beyond the shadow of a doubt, is giving you within years of his birth. So when we know, when we talk about things within years in prophecy, it is right, right on. Right on. Anybody have any idea who that prophet would have been? How about Daniel? The prophet Daniel, when he talked about his 70 weeks, the 70 weeks uh, we talk about, we learn about, and then it was very, very difficult to understand when you look at the numbers. But they understood it back then. They understood it. Okay. They knew when, when Daniel wrote this out, they, they, were, they were smart enough. The scholars were smart enough to be able to understand what, they, uh, what Daniel was talking about. Scholars today can reflect back and look at Daniel and say, yes, that was pinpointed in Daniel. What he talks about in Daniel in chapter 9, he says, no one understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and trenches, but in times of trouble. That is the seven, as part of the seven sevens, sixty-two sevens they talk about. The 70th week prophecy indicates a specific time of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on what we call Good Friday. So they could take from what Daniel said this, and if you can figure it out yourself, which I always have to read through it many times over to be able to do it, it will take you from the time he said the prophecy was given to Jesus' triumphant entry to Jerusalem. Those dates match up exactly to the day. So they knew that sometime within that period of a person's lifetime, a Messiah would come to this world. Taking out Daniel chapter 9, we have that opportunity to do that. And so we know that signs are given. We know that the shepherds on that night, a sign was given. You will find the babe wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger, the angel told the shepherds, in Bethlehem. The sign was given. The star that the Magi followed, a sign was given. A sign. But what about today? What about today? That was the first advent, the first coming of Jesus. Do we have signs today? We always talk about Him coming back. We always talk about being ready for His return, and He's coming back soon. 
There are, are we given signs today of that? How do we know? What are the signs today? Are, do we find the signs written in Scripture that we can back as Christians in Scripture? And that's just what I want to share, just to take, just take the next couple minutes just to share with you. So if you have a pen, you may want to jot down a few things, okay? If you need a pen, I have one. Does anybody want a pen? Everyone has a pen. Great. You guys keep prepared. In 2 Peter, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Today, let me ask you this. Today, are we finding that it seems like the world more and more and more, there's more scoffers today, more people mocking Jesus, making fun of the return of Jesus? We've been talking about it for quite a while, and yet people are making fun of that. Scoffers are there. You find that today? I find that. I mean, it just seems like it's more today. Oh, during this Christmas season, you know, once we get through 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock maybe on Christmas afternoon, you know, then all the scoffers re-emerge because they're just celebrating gifts and giving and that kind of thing, you know. But, um, you know, now we're, you know, we're going to be going out of the Christmas season and Santa Claus is gone. He went back to the North Pole or, where, you know, wherever. And now we're talking about Jesus getting the scoffers are there. The mockers are there. They're going to make fun of you because of what you believe in. Scoffers. You know, a little bit later on in that same chapter, Peter tells us that we need to be, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. You know, what is your hope? Is your hope in eternal life, spending all of eternity with Jesus in heaven? If it is, do you have an answer when people, when the scoffers, when the mockers come to you? Are you able to give them the reason for the hope that you do have? We always need to be ready. Always need to be ready. So what are the signs of the day? What are the signs of the day? I think probably the one that jumps out, sticks out more than any, has to be the, the, the holy cost and the re-emergence of Israel as a country. And the Holocaust bringing to that point, you know, the, um, uh, the Jews survived the Holocaust. It's an amazing thing that they were able to do that. But they survived the Holocaust. And, and, and we look at Ezekiel. I'm going to talk about Ezekiel for a second. And we're all, we're all familiar. We've all heard the prophecy of the dry bones, right? Everybody's familiar with that. But uh, over 2,600 years ago, here's what the prophet wrote. He said, then he said to me, son of man, these bones, think of this, now I want you to think hard. These bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Now give them this message from the sovereign Lord. O oh, my people, I will open the graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord, taken from Ezekiel chapter 37, 11 to 13, the, about the dry bones, okay? The dry bones we know are the people of Israel. We know that. The Jews, those are the dry bones. Following that first century Roman conquest of the Holy Land, the Jews, they were banished. They were banished from the land of Israel. They were sent into exile. And in that area, the Romans renamed Palestine, okay? Palestine. But in Ezekiel 37, way before that, God promised to bring the Jews back out of exile, back to their homeland of Israel. He said he would open the graves. A, a group of people who was all been annihilated by Hitler had been raised back up. When they felt all hope was gone, could not imagine what that had to have been like in the concentration camps when they just lined Jews up and just annihilated them. Couldn't imagine. All hope was gone, but, but Ezekiel promised that the graves would be opened up and, and that the, when the Jews are feeling that all hope is gone, they would be raised back up. Hitler took that 
But out of that Holocaust, God brought out the Jewish people back to Israel. And the significant date, maybe not given in Ezekiel, but talked about in Ezekiel, May 14, 1948, the nation of Israel reappeared to fulfillment of that scripture. An independent nation. The people brought back. So since 1948, when when Israel became a nation again, we started talking about the signs of the end times. Probably the greatest sign given of the coming of the end times. The prophet Zechariah wrote this, he says, I will make Jerusalem and Judah like an intoxicating drink to all the nearby nations that send their armies to besiege Jerusalem. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone, a burden for the world. None of the nations who try to lift it will escape unscathed. You know, we, we read that in Old Testament Scripture, we kind of try to figure out well, what does all that mean and when is all that happening and did it happen and and in 1967, that happened when, Israel, when the Israelis retook Jerusalem in what's called the Six Day War. Okay? Had to take, had to take the time and, and look that up sometime. We talked about the Temple Mound, if you remember that. If you research that a little bit. Okay? And everything that's going on in the world pointing to this. You know? Resolutions have been passed. The UN has done things. Diplomatic crisis wars have all been fought over this. This peace thing, all taking place. You know, prior to, prior to Israel becoming a nation again, they were just kind of like a forgotten people. Now Israel is always at the center of everything, and things are heating up. Things are heating up. Jesus was with his disciples. They were at the Mount of Olives. And if you remember this, his disciples came to him privately and they asked him a question. They said, tell us, when will all these things happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nations will go to war against nations and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus pointed out three specific things in that scripture. And things that when you look it up have increased in frequency over the years. When you go back and look at history, take the last 500 years, and that's where all my statistics came from, and we're going to bypass all those, okay? The statistics of over the last 500 years of the increase in wars. Unbelievable. And famine and in earthquakes. Every century is getting more and more and more. Jesus said this is going to happen. And it's happening. It's happening. How many wars and earthquakes? I'm, like I said, I'm not going to get into it with you, but you know, I have pages of it. Just, just an amazing thing. Uh, How many, you know, just exactly, you know, what we're looking at, just, you know. And then the rise of Gog and Magog, the alliances there, talking about, uh, uh, when you go in, back into the book of Ezekiel, again, chapters 38 and 39, here's what it basically says. It says, this is another message that came to me from the Lord, son of man, prophecy against Gog in the land of Magog, the prince of the rulers over the nations of Meshach and Tubal. 
Give them this message from the Sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out to your destruction. I will mobilize your troops and cavalry and make you a vast and mighty horde, a, a all fully armed Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer and all its hordes will also join you along with the armies of Beth from the distant north and many others. Now a lot of those countries aren't going by that name. They have other names today. But they'll be immobilized. Time's coming. Peace treaties are being made between Russia and Iran. And alliances are being made. Things are pointing to the end times. Pointing there. To be ready. We have a rise in, in the, pointing towards the one world government today. The monetary systems all pointing in that direction. You want a sign? They're there. But more importantly, let me ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready? When Jesus came in the world the first advent, the first Christmas, some were ready, some were not. Some accepted Him, most rejected Him. Is it any different today? Even we in our Christian world, going back to what Peter wrote, We've been talking about it for decades. We've been talking about it for centuries that Jesus is coming back. But where is he? You know, we, we haven't seen him. He's not here yet. And so they dismiss it. Just as they dismissed Jesus coming the first advent. But he's coming again. All signs are there. It's all pointing to it. Are you ready? Are your friends ready? Are your family members ready? That's the question. It's not hard to be ready. That's the great the truth of scriptures. That's the great truth of Jesus. Because it's by his grace that we're saved. It's nothing that we can do. No amount of works, no nothing. It's just His grace. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, He says you'll be saved. To get your heart right with Him. To know that He's coming back. He's coming back soon. You and I have that responsibility to share this good news with our family and friends. Because the time is short. I don't know. No one's going to be able to, no one can pinpoint that exact date. Because it says no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows the time. We just know we're in the season of his return. It could happen today. The father right now could be standing up and give him the call for his son to go get his church. If you were to do that today, would you go with the church? Or would you be left behind? Would your family go with the church? Or would they be left behind? That's the question this morning. Yeah, we come in to celebrate the advent, the coming of Jesus first time around, but we as Christians are looking forward to that second advent, second coming, when he comes back for his church. He'll come back and he'll reestablish his kingdom here on this earth after that. But are you ready? Is your family ready? Get your hearts ready. Just confess Jesus, that he is the Lord of your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Repent. Change your ways. Accept Him. And you too will be ready with excitement for the day that He's coming. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. He says, And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. The good news preached throughout the world. 
During the time of Jesus, they didn't have the mass communications abilities that we have today, obviously. God's Word is being preached throughout the world today. Governments are trying to stop it. But it's still being preached throughout the world. So once it's preached throughout the world, then the end will come. Not before that, but all the world will hear.